Hey everyone, it is good and pleasant when we are together in unity. Um, in the Psalms we read that and it is an honor for myself to have these guys here, <laughs> my friends here in my studio, which is my mom's house garage. It turned into a studio. This is what Jesus does in our lives. The messy things, <laughs> he changes into a beautiful place and uh, our hearts are not full of sin anymore, but full of praise because of who he is and what he has done. So I am forgiven because he was forsaken. We are accepted because he was forsaken and we are alive and well because he died and rose again. I'm accepted, you were condemned I'm alive and well, your spirit lives within me and Because you died and rose again Amazing love, how can it be That you might kill to die for me Thank you Jesus It's my joy to honor you in all I do. I honor you. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. Yesterday, um, through a friend of mine who was sponsoring one of the music videos, some um, guys were at my house for long hours. We were there and they were non believers. And the director, after spending 10 hours with me and my friends in that music video, he said, Hey, I have a question. You guys are talented and you guys are good, good people. Why are you Christian then? And uh, I'm like, why do you ask that question? He's like, because Christianity is just a religion and it's 2,000 years ago. I'm like, no, 2,000 years ago, the king, king of kings, God came to this earth to pay the penalty of my sin, your sins. And that's why I love Jesus, because he loves me. Because when I was not worthy, even now I'm not worthy, he loves me. Who else would you find that would love you that much? And this guy was divorced, so <laughs> he referred to that. He's like, yeah, that's right. My wife actually left me and didn't love me anymore. But uh, we talked for more than half an hour 
with great results. Praise the Lord. God can use us in different circumstances. And I think the key to success to all these evangelisms that I've had is the love of God. When we refer to the love of God, it amazes people. When we make them understand that God loves them, God does not love sin. He hates sin, but he loves the sinner. And we are the sinners that he loves and can save. And he is mighty to save. Everyone needs compassion, love that never's fading. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior, the hope of nation. God is mighty to save, He is mighty to save, for we offer of salvation, He rose and comfort the grave, Jesus comfort the grave, take me as you find me, all my fears and failures, fill my life again. Life to follow everything I believe in. Now I surrender. is mighty to save, He is mighty to save, for a author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave, Jesus conquered the grave. That's why we worship, because He is good and He is mighty to save. This fun song my mentor Tommy Walker has written, I think, when he was in Africa or somewhere. And uh, we're going to have fun with this song. <laughs> but it's very simple, a powerful proclamation. Jesus, you're my master. You're my king. Jesus, you're my Lord, my everything. It's your blood that made me clean. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I'm not ashamed of your love, not ashamed of your grace, not ashamed of the cross, not ashamed of your word. This should describe a Christian. Let's do this. One, two, three. Love, not 
not ashamed of your grace, not ashamed of the cross, not ashamed of your work. From the highest mountain top to the lowest valley low, I shout your name until the whole world knows. Jesus, you're my master and my king. Jesus, you're my Lord, my everything. Jesus, it's your blood that makes me clean. But thanks to shout, I have to let these praises out I once was lost and so, so bound By your grace I have been found And if the world can scream and shout For the temporary things I can give my loudest praise to the Jesus I greet you in the name of our Lord, who is the Christ, and his name is Jesus. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We gather again on a weekly basis to be able to glean a reflection of God as he reveals himself a glimpse at a time, uh, reminding each other that it is not we're what we're going to figure out by being able to study his word together, but it's what he will reveal according to your heart and your soul. I ask, even as I prepare to offer some verses to you from his word, that the Holy Spirit calm your heart, give you the peace that transcends understanding, and gives our minds a unified front onto a topic which is greatly misunderstood and often avoided. Today we'll be speaking about fear. You may have a decal on your car that says, fear not. I've seen many vehicles with the decal. It's usually in a white font. It's usually in an aggressive font. And I believe that it has an exclamation after it. Fear not. It's usually on cars that want to go faster or trucks that are bigger. Fear not. And it is a exclamation of two words that can summarize really what one of those most insidious weapons are of the enemy, and that is fear. It seems to me that the more you live and experience life, the more you have an opportunity, if not checked, to fear something. Maybe it's just because of the experience. You've burned your hand on a hot skillet more times. You have fallen off a bike. You have uh, avoided an accident, or yet you've been in an accident. For as much as you live, you have more opportunity to fear something. Maybe that's what it is, at least in my life. If we were to divine fear a little bit, it could be the 
potential harm. As I speak to you now, my son is driving to visit his friend in northern um, Nevada in the city of Reno. His best friend just moved there for a job, and he's going to visit him. I had decided not to tell my son Joshua that I was watching him on my iPhone since I have a locator. We have locators of each other. Yet I couldn't resist when I saw that he was uh, at a lake that his siblings, he wasn't born yet, had fished at almost 25 years ago in Mammoth. He sent me a picture of crystal clear water with a trout in it. And I said to him, without letting him know that I was tracking him, looks like mammoth. And he said, you're right. And I quickly confessed. My confession to you now is as Joshua is driving up north to visit his friend. And it's important that I say that for fear of you thinking that he's going to Reno to gamble or anything. That I will pray that he be safe. Uh, the freeway or the highway up to Mammoth and then nor northern Nevada is in two directions with no barrier. Last night I briefly told him, have you practiced taking your car off the road if somebody comes at you headlong because I feared. Fear comes from experience because I have had a car coming directly at me at over 50 miles an hour. And I believe even to this day, and it happened right behind me on Washington Boulevard about 30 years ago, that God's angel moved that car. Otherwise, there would have been a horrific head-on collision. It is my fear that tracks my son now as he drives. Harm. There's a fear of uncertainty, of not knowing what the day will bring. I ask you, how much do you feel you need to know about what the day will bring? the fear of the future. There's fear because of past, of trauma, of an experience that you have realized and are afraid that will happen again. More incoherent, but just as insidious. The fear of whether you bring value. The fear of insecurity. The fear of being loved. At the core, at the root, armadain tushvarochuna anevor, there is a undercurrent of fear. As we look at the emotion, which is known to be one of the six negative emotions, fear, it is completely natural and God designed. God designed you to fear when you are in danger. How is it possible that the same God in his word in multiple locations says fear not? We'll look at that. But now as I give you an example of what is designed to be feared of is a benchmark or a rule of thumb. Most any fear that lasts more than 90 seconds is not from God. Uh, let me repeat that. Most any fear that lasts more than 90 seconds is not from God. Yesterday, I was uh, walking at Camp Adif. I was alone when I was walking, and I started surveying my mind whether Camp Adif, which is in the hills an hour and a half north of us in Pasadena, has bears. I thought, I don't think they have bears. Then I thought, I wonder if they have mountain lions, because I was walking at the outskirts of the camp, and I thought, what would I do if a mountain lion jumped in front of me or a bear jumped in front of me. Snakes, I'm not worried about. I wear boots and they go up 12 inches on my calf. Most, most snakes strike lower than 12 inches off your calf. Fear. If I did see a bear, God has designed me that for 90 seconds that I would make myself as large as possible which is easier for me to do than most of you. But fear tells me that if I were to see a fire, that I would not just put my hand in it. Fear is designed to protect us, and it has its place for about 90 seconds. Do you have fear in your life that lasts more? 
Once our enemy is identified, it makes much easier to wage a war against it. We really do not look beneath the surface of more familiar enemies to spot it. We rarely follow any of these foes down the far enough to see where the root is. This writes Jim Branch. This fear robs us of the intimacy we were created for. How can fear rob you of intimacy that we were created for? Fear robs us of the freedom that God longs for us to enjoy. It robs us of genuinely loving relationship. Fear can have the tendency to control our lives. And there are many names for it. Let's go to the basic design of God in our life. Fear was meant to protect us and not last more than 90 seconds. If there is a prevailing fear in your life, other words come forward, namely anxiety. Anxiety is a condition where we are constantly feeling out of control and fearful. What shall happen next? It's difficult not to be in control. Examples of not being in control. Sitting in a passenger seat of a car. Sitting in an airplane where you're not the pilot. There is a huge fear of flying, which diminishes the more you fly. As you realize, you don't need to be in control. Somebody is in control of that airplane that knows what he or she is doing. For me, I'm always glad when my pilot is a woman. I continue to attest that women in typically a man's job always do the job better. I like it when a woman is in charge of the airplane that I'm sitting in the back. Does fear take over your life? What lies are we believing in our lives that are simply not true? Hence, we come to the reality of the truth about the lies. And we forget what it means to have lies talk about the truth. Let's see what the Word of God says in Mark chapter 6, verse 45 through 52. It's a familiar passage that I'll read to you that has much to do with what we're talking about. The Gospel according to Mark, chapter 6, verses 45 through 52. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to Bethsheba while he dismissed the crowd. After leading them, he went up to a mountainside to pray. So Jesus and his disciples were parted. When evening came, the boat was in the middle of the lake and he was alone on land. Once again, Jesus and his disciples were parted. You've all heard the story, but please look at it from the perspective of fear. He saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. About the fourth watch of the night, he went out to them walking on the lake. He was about to pass by them, but when they saw him, the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. They cried out because they all saw him, and they were terrified. They were scared. They feared. Now, how is it possible that the disciples were fearful of the one person that they most revered, that they left the entirety of their life behind? Because according to the Word of God, they thought he was a ghost. Was he? No. It was a lie. The fact that they thought they saw a ghost was a lie because, in fact, they saw their master, their Messiah, Jesus. That was the truth. The Word of God says, Immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take courage. It is I. 
do not be afraid. Courage. Courage is a fear that has already said its prayers. A courage is knowing that you stand up and you've already spoken to your creator and that it's not a ghost, but it's the real thing. Do you fear? One of the most classic scripture passages in regards to this is in 1 John 4.18. This is the largest weapon against fear. 1 John, I'll read chapter 4, verses 16 through 21. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. I have to stop here for a second and say, it's almost a knee-jerk reaction, a default, an example of, of words that we say so often that are so profound, if not the most profound, and not fully know what we're saying. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God, and God lives in him. Transitive property. A equals B, B equals C, A equals C. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love, and God is love, lives in God, and in turn, God in him. In this way, love is made complete amongst us so that we will have confidence in the day of judgment because in this world, in Pasadena, in Armenia, in Glendale, in Montebello, in this world, we are like him. Verse 18, there is no fear in love. So the decal that goes on the car that says fear not refers to the fact that there is no fear in love, and God is love, so there is no fear in love. Once again, transitive property. Ninth grade math. But perfect love drives out fear, because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. My dear brother and sister who are listening to my words, this is what it says in the word of God. There is no fear in perfect love, and God is perfect love. Do you have fear? We love because he first loved us. Uh, I love this verse. It gives an opportunity to testify when you, as an outcome of love, um, pay for somebody's meal at the burger stand, uh, decide to uh, do an act of kindness, smile, sit next to a homeless person. And when you're asked a question, why do you do this? The answer is really easy. Because God first loved me. Uh, how could you love me? If you knew about me, you would never love me. Uh, I've mentioned the definition of love from this pulpit dozens of times. Once again, Love is the will of the good of another. Love is the will of the good of another. Why would you will my good? Because you don't know who I am. I smell. I have secrets. I do harm to people. The answer is in 1 John chapter 4, verse 19. I, we, love because... He first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, yet hates his own brother, he's a liar. For anyone who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, who he has not seen. This reminds us of the biggest weapon we have been given to wage war against fear. The greatest weapon that we have in our hand to wage war against fear is love. And like anything else, it's not just love, 
my will of your good, but it's perfect love. And his name is Jesus. Perfect love. It's not a ghost. He's real. When God created man, and according to the Gospel of John in the first chapter, specifically the 18th verse, we know that God, in the person of Jesus, created you and me. When God created man, we see a story that we have heard probably more than any other story because it's uh, popular with the children as well. Genesis, the creation story, and the fall of humanity in chapter 3, verses 3, verses, uh, verse 10. Let's go just before it. The serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman, Eve, said to the serpent, we may eat from the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. Oh, the serpent said, you will surely not die to the woman, for God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing the difference between good and evil. Here comes the fall of humanity. What is about to happen is why you and I are born with sin, original sin. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took it and ate it. And then she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord among the trees of the garden. But the, but the Lord God called to the man and said, where are you? And I have to ask the question, why would the all-knowing God, why would our all-knowing God ask the question, where are you? Did God not know where Adam and Eve was? Yes, of course he did. But he wanted them to realize, to admit to the fact. But the Lord God called to man and said, where are you? And he answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid. Because I was naked, so I hid. Adam had fear. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Once again, God knew who told them. They knew, God knew why they were afraid. But our Lord wants us to stand for our responsibility. Dr. John Knight, General Superintendent of the Church of the Nazarene, writes in his book, the essence of sin is to not take responsibility and to blame another. The essence of sin is to not take responsibility and even worse, to blame another. And that's what Adam did. The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what have you done? And then the woman exercised the essence of sin by not taking responsibility and she shifted it and said, the serpent deceived me. At the core of what we see in the fall of humanity, is fear. The first emotion that Adam had was his core emotion, and he said, but Lord, I was afraid. Step one. 
Number two, what was his motivation of having this fear? Adam said, because I was naked. He was exposed. His first reaction was fear. His second was the motivation, and that's because he was embarrassed that he was naked. And then he went to a strategy. He hid himself. What do you do when you deal with a negative emotion? Today, as we discuss fear. Once you get past that fear, what is your core motivation? Uh, why is it that you are fearful? Adam was fearful because he was exposed. He was naked. And then, and really, the crux of the matter is, what are you going to do? Adam hid. We live in a time which we are constantly tempted to let our fear rule our life. More than ever in our world, today, whether it be war in our own country, whether it be COVID, whether it be whether I should shake a hand or bump a hand, whether I should put on one mask or two or three, is the underlying current of not being in control, fear. We are afraid of our own inner impulses even, which we are not able to fully understand and control. As the Apostle Paul says, I do not do the things I know I should do, yet I do those things that I shouldn't. We are afraid of the increasing capability of humanity to destroy itself. And we stand at the door that God can punish us for eternal damnation. Is that your ultimate fear? It sounds uh, like a big downer. Henry Nowen writes, But wait, Jesus came to cast out our fears. Jesus announced a God that is perfect love that casts out fear. Jesus himself and all his messengers, whether they are apostles or angels, say constantly, Mivachnak, do not be afraid. But it is far from easy not to let the many real fears make us deaf to the reality that we have a perfect God who is love, and love casts out fear. Yet why is it even that I, and maybe you, are trained to fear? Why is it that we religiously are trained to be even comfortable with fear, as if we're supposed to have it? Psalm 110, 111.10 and Proverbs 1.7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. How is it that the word of God talks about the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom? We were taught to fear God as a virtue when we were small children. In fact, the word fear in Psalms and Proverbs means the awe that a small child has of somebody they honor or respect. Oh, the English word fear doesn't do it justice. As we look at the the etymology, when we look at the original word of fear, it is to live in the awe before God's wonder and virtue. Do you deal with anxiety on a daily basis? Uh, a consistent repetition of small fears, maybe large fears. I'm not a physician, and I can't even begin to explain the roots of how fear turns into living in anxiety, or even what chemical imbalances are and how chemicals in return that you put in your mouth mitigate how you are off balance. I don't take any of that lightly. I'm not here to give you a remedy or a prescription but all I can do is read the word of God to you. God is love. 
He wills your good. God is perfect love and perfect love casts out fear. And with this, I offer you this benediction that the prophet Isaiah wrote in chapter 41, verse 10. So, thus saith the Lord. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you, and I will uphold you with the righteousness of my right hand. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In a time and a year as uncertain as this, we shall have no fear because we are loved by perfect love. And his name is God. Christ Jesus, who died for our sins and showed us what it means to live. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He is with you. Be with him. Amen.